There's a really sharp and noticeable divide between how people talk about the information loss paradox in um, the, what you might call the high energy physics community and that part of the quantum gravity community that comes out of high energy physics on the one hand and how it's talked about among relativists and to a large extent among philosophers on the other hand. So among um, high energy physicists and string theorists, the pretty much uniform consensus is that one, the information loss paradox is enormously paradoxical and two, it must somehow be resolved in a way that doesn't lead to information loss. So for instance, you have, uh, how do I scroll, let's try. Arrow key? Yeah, I'm trying that. Yeah, yeah. Select. Oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, yeah. This is Sano Matha in a very influential recent review of the information loss paradox. We shall see there's a very precise statement of the contradiction found by Hawking, and that bypassing the paradox means a basic change in our understanding of how quantum effects operate in gravity. So, one, it's really important, we're going to need a, quote, basic change in our understanding, and two, we need to bypass it, i.e., yeah, it is paradoxical, the paradox needs to be resolved. And here's Lenny Suskind, uh, this is from his very popular book. Whatever else Maldestana and Witten had done, they proved beyond any doubt, no, 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 no great caution here, it must be said, that information would never be lost behind a black hole horizon. The string theorists would understand this immediately, the relativists would take longer. And the title of um, Suskind's book also illustrates the degree to which you have a sharp divide here. On the other hand, what you get coming out of uh, the community of relativists and the sort of overlapping um, community of people asking these questions from a philosophy of physics starting point tends to be a sort of almost an impatience with the way the debate is and a, a view that is not very paradoxical. This is just telling us that information is lost. And that way of thinking is right back to Hawking's original setup. Hawking just says, you know, because part of the information about the state is lost down the hole, the final situation is represented by a density operator rather than pure to quantum state. This means there is no S matrix, i.e. no unitarity, for the process of black hole formation evaporation. So Hawking doesn't see himself here as presenting a paradox. Hawking sees himself here as just presenting an argument whose conclusion is that information is lost. Uh, you see that in some more recent statements um, by relativists. Here's an in world in a very recent review of the information loss paradox. The proposals to avoid information loss typically require drastic violation of the local laws of physics. Loss of information does not violate any fundamental principle of physics and is not in any way a radical proposal. Thus, our strong inclination is to believe that there's loss of information in the process of black hole formation of evaporation. So physicists coming out of the tradition in classical general relativity, or at least this particular tradition of it, um, have, you know, a lot of influential people in that community have a strong view that, again, this is just that the information loss paradox is just the conclusion that information is lost in the evaporation process. And philosophers of physics have by and large gone along with that. So you have the sort of characteristically nuanced statement by a classic paper for this by uh, Gordon Bellard and John Irvin and Laura Ritchie. They say, assuming the black hole evaporation can be described by a space time of classical general relativity, that the evaporation is not of the thunderbolt type, which basically means it destroys the universe, and that the quantum aspects of the problem can be described by quantum field theory on those up to space time, None of the escape routes discussed in the literature provides a plausible way to avoid the conclusion that the post-evaporation state is mixed. Information is lost, as Hawking originally maintained. And here's Tim Maudlin being characteristically a little less nuanced. The so-called information loss paradox arises rather than the inaccurate application of foundational principles involving both mathematical and conceptual errors. The resources for resolving the paradox are familiar and uncontroversial being pointed out in the literature. The problem ought to have been dismissed 40 years ago. Recent radical attempts to solve the problem are blind alleys, solutions in search of a problem. I think I read that and I think, you know, come on Tim, don't hold back, tell us what you really think about the information cost. <laughs> okay, so this ought to be puzzling. Um, we've got a bunch of highly, very smart, very well-informed people, uh, or rather two such bunches, and they seem to be coming to profoundly different conclusions here, almost the point they seem to be talking past each other. Uh, we can ask why. So, I mean, Maudlin, in fact, has a suggestion. Probably no completely satisfactory non sociological explanation is possible. In other words, yeah, there, there was a perfectly straightforward answer right there in Hawking's argument all along. It's just that for some sociological reason, it's just being missed by the community of string theorists. 
Well, it's possible. A um, number of reasons I'm sceptical about that way of thinking about it. One of which is that among the physicists who advocate, or recently have advocated, the conclusion that black hole, inf black hole evaporation is not an information-losing process, um, contrary Hawking's original claims, is Stephen Hawking. One of Hawking's much later work on the information loss paradox, Hawking certainly came to the conclusion that the evaporation process was, after all, unitary. So if the, um, if the explanation as to why the string theory community in quantum gravity thinks that the information loss paradox is paradoxical and must be resolved by no information loss is that none of these people have pro properly read Hawking, then among the people who've not properly read Hawking is Hawking. I think there's an alternative way of seeing why it is that these communities are reaching such different conclusions. Here's semi method again. Not everyone understands Hawking's paradox the same way. And that's basically going to be the theme of the talk. I'm going to suggest that there are really two different, clearly related, but ultimately distinct, problems or observations that deserve the name black hole information loss paradox. The first of those paradoxes seems to be the one that relativists have in mind, certainly the philosophers of physics have traditionally had in mind, and that paradox is not ultimately compelling, and the, and the dissolution of that paradox given by that community seems broadly reasonable in itself. The other paradox is what I think the high energy physics string theory community is concerned with, uh, and that is genuinely paradoxical, and genuinely gives us reason to think of uh, that there's something sort of profound in quantum gravity that we're not getting. I should say that while I've set this up um, just as motivation in a somewhat historical way, I'm not really going to give a historical or history of ideas kind of talk. So while I'm reasonably confident that I am basically getting the sociology of the discipline right, I'm not going to argue for it very much. What I really just want to present is the first order, order ideas here, that we have two sharply distinct concepts of the information loss paradox, and it's the second that's really interesting from a foundation point. So here's what I'm going to do in the talk. I'm going to start off by reviewing what I take to be the current state of the art in black hole thermodynamics and black hole statistical mechanics. This part of the talk is going to go fairly fast and be sort of fairly surface. Uh, the first half of that review, which is the black hole thermodynamics material, is very much the content of the seminar I gave to this group about this time last year. Uh, the second part of it is covered in another review paper of mine that's sort of a direct sequel to that one on black hole statistical mechanics. So while I'm happy to talk about the details of that in the discussion, I'm going to go for it relatively quickly in, in this part of the presentation, just to see what at least the sort of high energy physics quantum gravity community sees themselves as having established at this stage, whether or not they're correct to think that. I'm then going to talk about the, the two concepts in the information loss paradox, uh, and then particularly I'm going to focus on the second concept of the paradox, show why I think it's paradoxical, uh, why it's not straightforwardly dismissed by some of the moves made in response to the first form of the paradox. And I want to show the extent to which recent developments in quantum gravity, recent by philosophers' sense, recent in you know, the last 15 years or so, have, if anything, really sharpened the paradox and left it you know, really more fundamentally confusing. So, classical black hole thermodynamics. There's, all, there's an almost, as, as I see the structure of this, there's an almost perfect analogy between black hole thermodynamics, that is the laws of thermodynamics written down by Bardi et al. in the early 70s, and the ordinary thermodynamics of self-gravitating bodies, as long as heat flow is not present, with the way the analogy works being that uh, energy and angular momentum are played by themselves, and entropy is played by the surface area of the black hole. Just to cash that out in a little more detail, um, we have sharp analogues of the first law of black hole therm of thermodynamics as a black hole law of thermodynamics. Uh, the first law can be understood both as a statement about the equilibrium states of the system uh, and as an, op an operational claim about what happens if we slightly perturb those equilibrium states, just as there's a dual interpretation of the ordinary first law of thermodynamics. We have a fairly sharply conceived notion of equilibrium of black holes characterized just by the energy and the other conserved quantities, just as in ordinary thermodynamics. 
we have a wealth of evidence ranging from analytic to numerical to, in the days of LIGO, empirical, that black holes perturb away from equilibrium, rapidly return to equilibrium. Um, we, have a fair, we have fairly general analysis of the idea that we can distinguish between irreversible and reversible perturbations of a black hole, with, with the um, notion of irreversibility being as you move around the space of equilibrium, black holes can you move back again. And we have the condition that the criterion for reversibility is non increasingness of entropy, where entropy is being played by area here. And we have Hawking's very general differential geometric results going well beyond the equilibrium regime that black hole area cannot decrease. We also have an extension of these ideas with you know, a, sh a sharp level of success to the local description of the black hole surface as a, as, as a thermodynamic system with local thermodynamic properties like energy density, charge density, stress energy density and the like, via the membrane paradigm developed by Kip Thorne and a bunch of co-workers in the 1780s. Most of this is in standard general relativity with the einstein hilbert action, but we can extend it, if we're willing to complicate the entropy area formula with additional terms, to arbitrary diffeomorphism covariant theories of gravity. If you have a particle physics background, this matters, because from that starting point, you're inclined to think that the einstein hilbert action is just the first term in a sort of infinite expansion of possible uh, interaction terms that you get in an effective quantum field theory of gravity. But the whole thing completely falls apart classically uh, as soon as you try to reproduce those features of thermodynamics that contain more than one system. Most of the real core of thermodynamics is about how we allow heat to flow from one system to another, about how we can decrease the entropy of one system provided we increase the entropy of another system, and the idea that temperature can be understood as a, as a criterion for when spontaneous heat flow occurs. In classical black hole thermodynamics, because black holes don't radiate, then the analogy entirely breaks down in that situation. And so classically remains simply an analogy. As is widely known, the revelation by Hawking building on other people's work in the 70s on, and the a, a development of, having, of how you do quantum field theory on a curved space-time background transformed that situation. Hawking demonstrated that once you allow for quantum field theory on the background of a black hole, then the black hole is surrounded by an almost thermal atmosphere of radiation. It's mostly trapped behind the angular momentum barrier of the black hole, but it gradually leads through that barrier and radiates away. Hawking originally derived this through a sort of mode matching situation in, um, in linear field theory. It's been derived at least five different ways, I know, with those derivations making radically different conceptual starting points, make approximations of radically different kinds, working in very different regimes, they all reproduce the same result there. So while, as good empiricists, it's proper to, to, um, to always maintain a certain level of caution about um, the existence of any phenomena we haven't actually checked, and of course we still haven't remotely directly observed black hole radiation, then short of upending the entire structure of quantum field theory, it looks extremely solid to conclude that black holes do indeed radiate. And the existence of Hawking radiation completes the thermodynamic description of black holes. It allows heat transfer between black holes and other black holes. Perhaps more importantly, it allows heat transfer between black holes and other ordinary thermodynamic systems. So from the point of view of a thermodynamics um, description, black holes and again, from the point of view of external observers, black holes behave just like thermal systems. And furthermore, we have extremely strong theoretical evidence that the Hawking radiation does carry away energy in the ordinary way radiation should. Where energy here is understood in some kind of asymptotic nerta style sense uh, in terms of the asymptotic Minkowski symmetries of the black hole space time. We can, we can look at those results by looking at the the general asymptotics and applying Nernst's theorem. We can look at it by looking for solutions. How the Einstein equa um, field equations work far from the black hole. We can look at vacuum perturbation near to the black hole. We can do numerical calculations of what solutions the semi-classical equations look like, and they all deliver the result that, as measured at infinity, the energy flux out of a black hole is just what you'd expect it to be if you treated the radiation as ordinary cooling radiation. Okay, so. I should say, at this point, I've now more or less finished summarising the content of the talk I gave this time last year. So, black holes behave just like ordinary thermodynamic systems. Every other ordinary thermodynamic system we know in the universe behaves like an ordinary thermodynamic system, 
because it's underlaid by a statistical mechanical description. In particular, underlaid by a statistical mechanical description in which entropy, at least the first pass, can be understood as the logarithm of the uh, available dimension of degrees of freedom consistent with the macro properties of, of the system. So it becomes compellingly tempting to ask, can one find a statistical mechanics for black holes that reproduces black hole mechanics? Even without any direct success finding such a thing, we'd have really quite strong reason to think it's worth looking for one, because otherwise it seems to be a pretty inexplicable miracle that black holes plug into the general structure of thermodynamics so beautifully well. But in fact, a great deal of evidence has been found. Um, it basically comes in in three parts, or at least on my analysis it comes in three parts. There's the evidence that comes from doing calculations in quantum field theory and regarding general relativity as an effective quantum field theory at low energies. There are results which come out from calculations in string theory and the results which come out from uh, calculations using the ADS CFT correspondence. I am reliably informed, although this goes beyond the scope of my talk, that there's also significant evidence of a robust black hole statistical mechanics coming out of other approaches to quantum gravity, in particular coming out of the loop um, quantum gravity program. Limitations of time and my own expertise mean that I'm going to restrict my attention to the, the, to the dominant string theoretic program in quantum gravity. But of course, insofar as I want to make the case that black holes have a robust statistical mechanics, if you can find that in other approaches to quantum gravity, then it strengthens rather than weakens the case. So talking about the quantum field theory calculations, um, what we're doing here is just saying, okay, let's suppose that quantum gravity, at it, where at salient energy is well below the Planck scale, is just a quantum field theory. Um, and we'll just use ordinary methods of quantum field theory to calculate the entropy, or more precisely the partition function, and derivatively of that the entropy, just using path integral means and using standard approximations in that theory. And as usual, you end up with a sort of hierarchy of approximations based on perturbations around the classical result. The tree order calculation is to say the lowest order approximation, the one you get where you approximate the path integral just by taking its extremal value, reproduce the classical entropy for arbitrary diffeomorphism covariant forms of the action. Which is to say, the first order value of the entropy you get if you do a, 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 a count the number of states calculation, just using the formal machinery field theory, already reproduces the number we got from phenomenological thermodynamics, which wasn't itself underpinned by any notion of state counting. If you do the one loop correction, so the next order of approximation, um, which roughly um, translates to adding the entropy contribution you get from uh, particles um, in a thermal state on the black hole spacetime, you find that gives you a correction to the entropy. Um, you actually find it gives you a correction which appears divergent, which is to say formally infinite, which might panic you, but uh, physicists have learned not to be panicked by formally infinite terms. Uh, the formally infinite terms you get are divergent terms which you'd expect to be absorbed into the renormalization of the gravitational constant. When you use the methods for absorbing them into, into that renormalization that you already worked out in flat space or near flat space quantum gravity, you find that you get exactly the right effect to replace the bare gravitational constant in the, in the tree order calculations with the renormalized value of the constant. In other words, to recover the, the, the value of the constant you want to put into the calculations. Plus, you get a bunch of finite terms which are important for the logarithm of n, which are negligible in the classical limit. In string theory... Just, yeah, yeah, sure. So does effective field GR, is this like linear, like quantum, linearized gravity and then have the quantum theory of linearized gravity? No, I'll just say I've got a path integral, um, so I'll say the, um, I'll, just, I'll, I'll, I'll consider that my degrees of freedom are the, the G field or whatever matter fields I have in mind, um, and I'll assume the theory is defined by the path integral over those degrees of freedom. Um, so that, that theory is under sort of reasonable control, they're not nearly as solid control as flat space quantum field theory. So one of its limiting regimes is the linearized approximation we're talking about, but you know, formally speaking, what it requires to be valid is that we're not considering excitation energies at the Planck scale. It doesn't. It, it, does, it doesn't. Um, it doesn't restrict linearity. It doesn't. It doesn't um, rule out self gravity. So you do it as the path integral, and then you're just summing over all possible yeah. in your new field. Exactly. So you don't have to say path. anything about a background field. That's right. Yes. Now, I mean, in, as a practical matter, <coughs> there aren't very many calculations you can do with that framework that don't require to say something about background. Um, but the the QFT, the, these calculations kind of are in that category. So, so what you're doing 
uh, in, in a little bit more detail is you're saying, okay, I can write down formally what the path integral is supposed to be that defines the partition function. I'll approximate it to zero order just by its minima. And so that involves, and so those are given by the action plus boundary terms. Uh, and this, now the sum over history is just the sum over different, um, different manifolds of the same boundary condition. So there's a contribution that's coming from the Minkowski uh, manifold and another contribution coming from the Schwarzschild manifold. Uh, and the, um, uh, what you find is that the, the, Schwar the, the, the dominant terms, the terms coming from the Minkowski piece, but there's a, yeah, I mean, I've already the, 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 the dominant term will come from the Schwarzschild piece, but there's a term on it. There's a, there's a part of that term that's just the Minkowski background, which is just, I think of it as like the thermal graviton bath, but then there's another term that's coming from the, the black hole term. And then the one loop piece effectively is doing linearized gravity against that given background. Okay. Okay. There's a certain amount of work that takes you to the two loop order and gives you a sort of stochastic theory, but I'm not aware of any significant calculations of this kind done in that framework. Okay, so that's the QFT case. Um, so for the string theory case, um, it turns out in string theory that certain rather special classes of black hole can be analysed, uh, again, using ordinary statistical mechanical methods. Uh, and the way this story basically goes is, in, in general, um, we don't have a sort of sharp calculus even to say which kind of string theoretic states should look like black holes. But in certain special cases, we can uh, we, we, we can argue that the, uh, the Hilbert space dimension for given degrees of freedom remains constant as you tune the parameters from uh, very weak values where we can do the calculations to very strong values that seem to describe the black holes. The class of black holes you can describe there are the so-called extremal black holes, which occur um, when the black hole has a sufficiently large amount of charge and or angular momentum to be right on the edge of ceasing to be a well-defined black hole. Those states can helpfully be thought of as a kind of generalized ground state in the thermodynamics of black holes, because an extreme black hole has zero temperature. And at least in some circumstances, depending on how you set it up, then uh, a black hole uh, with both mass and charge will radiate away mass more rapidly than it radiates charge, so it will move towards extremality. Um, so it's, it's a fairly familiar fact from ordinary statistical mechanics that you can calculate the thermal properties of zero temperature systems a lot easier than you can the properties of finite temperature systems. And so it turns out here. So in, in, in these scenarios, and, and for small perturbations around these scenarios, um, you can work out what the entropy formula should be using ordinary classical black hole thermodynamics. You can also work out those log m corrections I talked about in the quantum field theory calculation. You can also work out those corrections I was talking about from corrections to the Einstein-Hilbert action, and that gives you quite a complicated formula for the entropy of, a, um, of an extremal black hole that goes some way beyond just the area formula. And then you can also work out what the entropy should be in a completely different way using a statistical mechanical counting method of string theory, and you finally get the same answer out. And these are you know, quite, quite accurate, quite detailed uh, reproductions of the structure. So I'm going to talk you through what those various numbers are. They're, they're conserved quantities and numbers of fields in the particular string theory set out to be considered. So on one hand, uh, those calculations certainly don't extend to astrophysically realistic black holes. These aren't even black holes in four space-time dimensions. On the other hand, it would be something of an in inexplicable miracle that you got this level of reproduction. It wasn't the case that um, four quant the, the string theory in these situations had some kind of appropriate general altruistic limit with black holes in and conversely that the thermodynamics of black holes in those regimes wasn't, um, uh, uh, didn't, didn't have a string theoretic statistical mechanical underpinning. That doesn't give you any reason, I should say, to think string theory is true. I think it gives you quite strong reason to think that string theory is a consistent quantum theory of gravity in these regimes, and quite strong reasons to think that, um, at least in these regimes, then there is a statistical mechanical underpinning for black hole thermodynamics. Uh, and the third route is via, more recently, and this is the kind of thing that really convinces the physics community, is via the ADS-CFT correspondence. So this is the correspondence, which I'll talk about only very briefly, between quantum gravity on a space-time that's asymptotically anti de Sitter um, and a quantum a conformal field theory on the boundary of that space-time. It's worth saying, just as a way of thinking about this, um, uh, if you think of this as a, as a cosmological result about possible worlds which, are, which have anti de Sitter um, to, um, boundary conditions, then 
you, I don't think you really get the right picture of it. This is the, 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 the community here largely thinks of entering the city space time as a kind of covariant version of putting the system in a box. So this is supposed to be, you know, like I regularize my system by introducing a very, very small negative, negative um, uh, cosmological constant. Uh, in much the same way as I regularize various field theoretic systems by putting them in a box with reflecting boundary conditions rather than taking asymptotic of the infinite boundary conditions. One can't rigorously establish, but one can heuristically highly plausibly suggest that if the boundary is sufficiently far away, or in the black hole case, if the value of the, of the, of the cosmological constant is sufficiently small, then uh, the only differences are now at boundary issues which could be happening 10 to the power of 100 light years away from the black hole, and so we shouldn't expect the local physics to depend very much on how we set the boundary conditions. That, you know, one can gain say that conclusion, but it's very much following a, a fairly standard line in contemporary physics. So the correspondence itself is by no means proven. Um, it's not even completely sharply stated. After all, neither side of the story has a completely sharp statement in the first place. We don't have a completely sharp statement of what a quantum theory of gravity is. We don't have a completely sharp statement of what a quantum field theory is. So not surprisingly, we don't have a completely sharp statement of equivalence claim between them. Um, but there's an extremely large amount of calculational evidence for it, which is to say that there's an awful lot of situations where I can calculate something on one side, work out what it's supposed to correspond to on the other side, calculate that thing as well by completely different methods and find the net up. So I'll do just one particular example. It's a thing called the anomalous dimension of the Kanishian operator. I'm not going to talk through the details of that because A, it will get far too complicated, and B, I don't really understand them. Um, I borrowed the example from a colleague. Um, but if you count, this is a quantity which you can calculate by perturbative methods uh, on the field theory side and on the uh, black hole side, oh, sorry, and on the, um, yeah, the interior side. You can calculate it to one loop order. This is a, as a function of a certain parameter and not be super impressed. You might get slightly more impressed when you get this level of accuracy. Slightly more impressed to third order. When you start seeing that reproduction of the structure to fourth order, then you think, well, okay, um, now this really seems on to something. A way of putting it is, even the highly implausible circumstance one was able to do the calculations to reproduce the fifth order, would you really be willing to bet that it wouldn't reproduce the right term? <coughs> well, if you did take that bet, you'd be in trouble because it actually has been done to fifth order, and that's the continuation term. And again, there's a perfect match here on both sides of the correspondence. So things like these make the community again, and frankly make me, pretty confident that there is a sharp statement of the correspondence around whether that statement is correct, or at least gets close to correctness. And inside the ADS-CFT correspondence, we can now look at black hole statistical mechanics, because the statistical mechanics of the, on, the, on the conformal field theory side can be mapped over through the duality to a statistical mechanics on the um, quantum gravity side, and the field theory description is under much better control, so it's easier to do calculation stuff now. It has the right qualitative features to reproduce the thermodynamic description of black holes, so if you look at the you know, in, in the general case, if you try to work out what kind of thermodynamics you get, if you do the statistical mechanics of the, um, of the formal field theory, you get exactly the right quality of structure. In general, you can't calculate quantitatively, but in the special case of the correspondence between ADS3 and CFT2, uh, we have a thing called the Cardi formula, which really does let us calculate the quantitative structure of the statistical mechanical um, uh, partition function on the CFT side, and we get an exact reproduction of the known res of results for the thermodynamic account on the um, ADS side. And in fact, actually, you can extend this uh, setup to cover not just the two-dimensional case, but the, the mouths of extremal black holes, which look like ADS3 times a compact factor. And in fact, in you can retrospectively reinterpret those extremal calculations as ADS-CFT calculations. So all of that leads us to a sort of conclusion of this first half of the talk, leads us to a, what you might call a quantum membrane paradigm, which basically says, look, I've got a stationary black hole. From the point of view of any observer outside the black hole, I can treat that black hole in all respects as a quantum mechanical system in the form of a thin membrane at thermodynamic equilibrium. And in particular, if I look at the energy order E subspace of quantum states of this membrane, then they satisfy the dimension of that subspace is proportional to <coughs> e to the a over 4, where a over 4 is the usual uh, beckenstein hawking entropy of that black hole. And I'm simplifying here by restricting to the spherical case of the Schwarzschild case. 
So I'm going to be assuming that that's the starting point I'm going to be assuming to see where the paradox comes from. Of course, if one simply doesn't accept the existence of a robust black hole system mechanics, this doesn't get off the ground. Um, but I don't really third to say in this talk as to why I think that should be accepted. Oh, and sorry, yeah, I should say, of course, on this story, the emission of Hawking radiation can be interpreted as just the ordinary thermal cooling of that membrane by you know, the ordinary interactions between the membrane and short wavelength states of the electromagnetic field and whatever, whatever other fields you have in mind. Okay, let me talk briefly now about the first of the two sorts of paradox that people talk about, which I call here the evaporation time. So here's a kind of standard space-time picture of at least how a lot of people describe the evaporation of a black hole. So initially, here's the formation of the black hole. Um, uh, here, the, the, this, this is the early region before the event horizon forms. Here I've just got matter in falling. This second region is the region in which the event horizon is formed. Now the matter is shielded off from the space-time, the exterior space-time by event horizon. We don't really know how to fill in the details around here, but it kind of looks at least plausible that the right way to draw the space-time diagram now has a third region out here, which is the region after which the black hole is completely evaporated. And now if you look at the surface I've drawn here, um, surface sigma 1 is a Cauchy surface for this space-time. Every um, uh, part here passes through it. Um, <coughs> sigma 2 here is a Cauchy surface as well. I'd expect a unitary evolution from sigma 1 to sigma 2. The sigma 2, of course, is now, the, is now made up of two parts. This part inside the event horizon, this part outside the event horizon. Uh, I, I expect these degrees of freedom now to be causally unable to influence these degrees of freedom because of the event horizon being formed. Sigma 3 here is not um, a Cauchy surface of the whole space-time. I can consider a time-like trajectory that just ends at the singularity here. This point here is a naked singularity. Uh, sigma 3 doesn't look like it should bear a unitary development of the data on sigma 1 and sigma 2. And in particular, it looks as if sigma 3 should not be tracking things going on on the interior part. So it looks as if the quantum state of region 3 is obtained by taking the quantum state sort of right at the end of region 2, tracing out those degrees of freedom within the event horizon, and giving me a transition from pure to mixed state. And that's basically, as frequently described in the relativist community, a pretty straightforward consequence of the fact that the evaporating black hole space-time is not globally hyperbolic. And I'm fairly persuaded by the claims by Unruh and Wilde and Bella et al. that there really aren't any very persuasive arguments that shouldn't be information loss in this situation. What kind of arguments might be in play? Well, people might say that this is just general quantum mechanics. Uh, and of course, you can define quantum mechanics as requiring unitarity if you like. Um, but you know, just as you can, you could define electromagnetism as being Hamiltonian electromagnetism if you like. But there's still a natural way of generalizing it to apply in non-globally hyperbolic contexts. And you know, the path integral framework seems to make sense on non-globally hyperbolic space times. Algebraic quantum field theory seems to make sense on non-globally hyperbolic space times. So it's at the very least not compelling that QFT doesn't make sense when extended to the non-globally hyperbolic context. Um, it's also the case that the mechanisms you might want to apply to prevent information loss all seem to turn on the moment of evaporation, which relies on client scale accounts of quantum gravity, so they're extremely speculative. So it might be reasonable to say, well, it, may be, it doesn't seem any obvious reason information shouldn't be lost, but in any case, if, it is, if it's somehow recovered, it's recovered in the regime of high energy quantum gravity, which we don't understand anyway, so it's, it's premature to worry about this. And there are long standing arguments. Um, but if we have an ununitarity, then because of the way quantum field theory works, then we end up with energy dissipation on Planck scales in ordinary flat space, just because we have components in the path integral, even for ordinary flat space transitions, that involve transitioning into black holes and back out again. And it's being argued that you can't quarantine those effects, that they naturally spread to lead to um, you know, dramatic violations of unitarity, even in ordinary physics. This is highly controversial, and, and again, the best you can say is it's really speculative. It speculates on how our high energy physics might be completed. So I'm prepared to concede that this evaporation time paradox is just not terribly exciting. Let me tell you about something I think is exciting. Um, I'll talk you through what's going on this graph in a moment. But let's, let's talk about the process of how ordinary quantum mechanical thermal systems cool. So 
So I imagine I've got my system that begins in a quantum mechanic at high temperature and for simplicity in a quantum mechanical pure state or close to a pure state. So if you look at that system, um, it's thermodynamic entropy is the log of the dimension of the full subspace of Hilbert space at that energy. I need to have some kind of band of energy to make it well defined, but that's not, that just gives you a harmless constant in the logarithm. The von Neumann entropy of the um, of, of, of the system initially is zero because it's in a pure state, or really small at any rate. The, the, the state's either pure or is occupying a really tiny fraction of the, of the full Hilbert space that's nearly pure. So, so it starts. So it starts off with a a, a microcanonical um, statistical mechanical entropy that's way, way, way higher than its um, full on entropy. It cools by emitting thermal photons. A given thermal photon is basically a maximum mixed state consistent with the energy constraints in play. So to be in a maximum mixed state, that emitted thermal photon has to be entangled with the system that's emitted. Um, and so the, and, you know, given that if I've got a pure state, the, the, I've got an entangled pure state, the entropy of one half equals the entropy of the other half, you can see that each time I emit a thermal photon of a certain entropy, um, which is thermal by virtue of entanglement with, with the cooling system, then the cooling system's entropy needs to be increased by the same amount. So the von Neumann entropy of the cooling system, as long as it's emitting perfectly thermal radiation, is going up. Meanwhile, because uh, for pretty much any well-behaved thermodynamic system, uh, entropy is an increase in function of energy, as the system cools down, the microcanonical entropy is going down. So even as, in some heuristic terms, the quantum state is spreading out over a larger part of the available Hilbert space, the available Hilbert space is shrinking down. Eventually, that point reaches ahead. And what's called the page time <coughs> of the entropy and the microcanonical entropy um, coincide. And at this point, the quantum state of the cooling body is maximally mixed, um, given the energy there. And at this point, it's no longer possible for the system to emit emitting radiation that's exactly thermal on pain of violating the energy. What has to happen? Pretty much this, that now the, the emitted photons, or emitted whatever of radiation, are now entangled with the early time radiation. The entanglement is transmitted out to the early time radiation in an enormously scrambled way, so that, in principle, you could recover the, um, the, that quantum mechanical entanglement from sufficiently delicate measurement of the early time and late time radiation. And now the von Neumann entropy of the cooling system turns down, stays at about the maximum it can reach, and right at the end of the cooling process, the quantum system is back to a pure state. This is assuming, in, for simplicity, assuming the, the non-degeneracy of the ground state of the system, in any case, it's back down to something much smaller. So that's what should happen for an ordinary cooling system according to the unitary rules of quantum mechanics. Well, we buy the quantum membrane paradigm, black holes are ordinary thermal, thermodynamic systems cooling by the rules of quantum mechanics. So for a black hole, we should assume that its von Neumann entropy <coughs> increases the more radiation is emitted, that its microcanonical entropy equals portion of its area is decreasing the more um, radiation is emitted, and eventually those will uh, meet, and at that point the radiation will have to stop being thermal. And the page time of the black hole is the point at which the radiation must stop being thermal. And crucially, this is about halfway through the evaporation process. I mean, black hole radiation, uh, de, you know, bl black hole evaporation rate um, scales the inverse cube of the black hole size. So, black hole evaporation time scales the cube of the black hole size. So, it's, yeah, it's kind of quite late. It might be 90% of the way through the process or something, but it's nothing like at the end of the process. There's 10 to the 60 or 70 years to go at the evaporation process at this point. And crucially, the black hole is still pretty big at this point. If I start the solar mass black hole, it reaches this stage when it's you near know, all of the order half a second. In other words, this is, a, this is not now a sort of planky and heavy dragons regime of extreme quantum gravity. This looks like a regime in which the ordinary rules of quantum field theory ought to remain applicable that, you know, far away from singularity. Well, that's a problem, because the ordinary rules of quantum field theory are the things we use to divide the Hawking radiation, and they tell us that the Hawking radiation is exactly thermal. In fact, the way these derivations work is that the Hawking radiation is thermal because there's maximal entanglement between the outgoing radiation and a sort of mirror pair on the interior of the event horizon. So if it's the case um, that the black hole is an ordinary quantum mechanical cooling system, that Hawking description must become completely wrong 
at the page turn. And we have a clash here between the quantum membrane paradigm and the quantum field theory, or if you like, a clash between the quantum statistical mechanics we developed on the basis of the Hawking effect and the Hawking effect itself. Yeah. So can I just put this a way that <coughs> sort of for me makes the point quite sharp? Sure. I mean, what, what's sort of built into the ordinary QFT then is unitarity, right? And the problem here is, okay, we might accept unitarity is going to fail at some point in this process. It would be okay if it, if it failed like right at the end when the thing blows up or something. Yeah. But the problem is the unitarity has to be broken much earlier than that. I think that's, yeah, that's, that, that's part of it. But I mean, also, just the ordinary, uh, on, on, the, on the membrane paradigm, and on, the, on a black hole stat mech of this kind, I ought to have a unitary description of the evolution of the black hole interior, exterior. And if there's a unitary description of the, of the evolution of the black hole exterior, the Hawking radiation is going to have to diverge from thermality again way short of the Planck time. You can imagine the unitary description of the exterior breaking at some late time, but again, this has to happen way before that late time kicks in. Okay. But it's the, yeah, it's the failure of the unitarity at somewhere and some place that you yeah. really don't think it should That's be. That's right. I mean, this is, this is something for you. Know, Astrophysics, yeah, well, the astrophysics doesn't matter because it's still in the incredibly distant future, but black holes where the curvature is just very low compared to uh, Planck scales. Indeed, you know, principal black holes where the curvature is very low compared to what it is in this room. Right. We'll still, you know, we'll still, should still be at a stage where their radiation is supposed to be non-thermal according to a static description and thermal according to Hawking. There's not going to be any quantum gravity modification to save you in this. Exactly. Or well, at least no obvious way to put it. So, so, so just to drive home the point that this is something that's happening way before the evaporation point, there's a concrete modern paper evident that whatever the information loss paradox is supposed to be, it does not arise through a non-evaporating black. Well, this form of the, eva of the evaporation of the information loss paradox arises in at least two situations I know, indeed for non-evaporating black holes. So, for instance, suppose I have anti-sift space-time again. So I told you this was kind of like a box. So I have a sufficiently large black hole in that box, then it can actually be stable because the radiation that's emitted has a time to bounce off the ADS boundary condition and come back again before the black hole's own mass has dec de decreased appreciably. I mean, you could achieve the same thing by putting a black hole just in a really big reflecting box, but it's cheaper to use ADS space time, given the construction costs for large boxes. Um, and in a system like that, you don't expect the black hole to evaporate at all. Um, and indeed, it, it's, it's robust against perturbation. But quantum field theory predicts, if, if, if I look at sort of two time correlation functions between some field strength at a point outside the black hole at time zero, and some field strength at the same spatial point at some much later time t, just time translating by the asymptotic time translator. I can write down a quantum field theoretic correlation function. According to the QFT results, that correlation function is exponentially decreasing without limit. But if the statistical mechanical description is true, then this whole system is finite dimensional at any given energy. And so Poincaré Cohen's type arguments tell me um, that the correlation function can't actually decrease exponentially without limit. It needs to reach a finite point bump along that finite point and eventually spike back up again. So you can see there's a, um, there's a clash here between what quantum field theory predicts and what membrane paradigm straight statistical mechanical description predicts, even for this sort of stable black hole in the box. Also, you consider those extremal black holes I was talking about, which again are stable. You can perturb those black holes away from extremality and let them decay back down again. I could take a rock, or more mathematically attractively a photon. I could shine it on the extremal black hole, it'll heat up a little bit, it'll cool down again by emission of Hawking radiation. According to the, um, uh, the QFT description, the radiation is exactly thermal again. Uh, according to the quantum mechanical description, there's a subtlety here, I can talk in the discussion, but the first, first blush here, because the whole thing's unitary and because the black hole state is left unchanged, then the emitted radiation I'd expect to be in a pure state. So I've got a, I want to tell a sort of S matrix scattering story about radiative scattering. Uh, off an extremal black hole, according to the quantum statistical mechanical description, I don't get that from the um, QFT description. Okay, so Quine has a very influential description of a paradox as something like a apparently impeccable argument to an impossible conclusion. And one natural way you can do that is by having two apparently impeccable arguments from the same premises which lead to conflict. So I'm going to claim, in that sense, the um, page time the page time paradox is a paradox. Uh, we don't straightforwardly seem to be able to resolve it without either abandoning 
quantum field theory in a regime where we really think it should be working, um, and in a regime which is what led us to believe a lot of this stuff in the first place, or, a quant or, or we have to abandon the whole quantum statistical mechanical description, which makes the success of black hole thermodynamics really puzzling, but much more importantly makes all of that series of concrete calculational results I was talking through in the first part of the talk into an inexplicable miracle. And that's weird. An unexplained miracle. <laughs> Quite so. <laughs> so it's tempting to look for a middle way, and you know, my hunch is there still must be a middle way, but the developments in, the, in, in recent years have, if anything, made it worse. On, on the one hand, the further results from the ADS CFT correspondence, and they kind of probably I'm flowing a bit in because the in, into like the regional discussion space because the discussions have sort of flowed in. I hope that's yeah, right. yeah, of course, yeah. of course. Um, so the results from the ADS CFT correspondence have really strengthened the case for unitarity and pretty much convinced the community of unitarity. And on the other hand, what's called the firewall paradox seems to have um, driven home more, even more so, how apparently unacceptable the conclusions are of rejecting perfect thermality of Hawking radiation. And I'm going to, the last part of the talk, I just want to talk through those briefly. So evidence for unitarity that's coming from the ADS-CFT correspondence. I mean, one quick way of thinking it must be unitary is something like, well, look, the CFT on the boundary is clearly unitary, so it kind of, you can see why you'd expect arguments to unitarity to be there. But people have, have wondered if that's really true, so I'll give a few arguments here that really quite strongly seem to suggest unitarity for ADS-CFT black hole. It's one of them. So we, we often talk about black hole radiation being big thermal, being black body. But you remember I said at the beginning that the Hawking radiation is largely confined between the black hole event horizon and the angular momentum barrier of the black holes, so sort of between about one and two or three short shield radius radius black hole. And it just leaks out. Well, that leaking process is not black body. It's much easier for low angular momentum nodes to get out than higher angular momentum nodes, for instance. Things called gray body factors tell you how the radiation far from the black hole is related to the original black body spectrum. And in principle, you can calculate those gray body factors by solving the wave equation on the black hole background. You can't do it analytically for a short shield black hole, but you can in some cases. And in particular, you can do it for certain near extremal black holes. Remember, extremal black holes don't radiate at all, but near extremal black holes radiate a little bit. And under those assumptions, you can calculate the gray body factors. It's officially complicated. I couldn't be bothered to process it in LaTeX, but it, you know, it's, it's, it has a closed form, but a fairly complicated. Malcine and Strominger, in one of the papers that was one of the starting points for setting up ADS-CFT, reproduced exactly those gray body factors by looking at the quantum decay of the excited string state that's supposed to correspond to the near extreme black hole. That's a manifestly unitary process. It's, it's a, the whole thing is, is pure to pure evolution. Um, but they got out exactly those formulae. So notice again, we've got this classic, I think this, this to be characterized <coughs> a lot of what's seen as, as evidence in this story, we have this class of results of completely different calculations leading to, or with a completely different form or completely different starting assumptions leading to the same result. Maldacino and Stromer just say in the paper, uh, this quote seems to have lost slide, the string decay rates extrapolated to the large black hole region agree precisely with the semi-classical Hawking decay rates in a wide variety of circumstances. However, the string method not only supplies the decay rates, but also gives a set of unitary amplitudes underlying the rates. By attempting to conclude these extrapolated amplitudes are correct. It's hard to imagine a mechanism which corrects the amplitudes but somehow conspires to leave the rates unchanged. I won't read the second part of the quote, but they go on to sort of push the forward home. Second bit of evidence for ADS CFT, think of a large black hole again. So remember the the um, according to the, the exact QFT description, then the two time correlations outside that black hole should be exponentially decreasing in time. According to the quantum statistical mechanical description, they should be exponentially decreasing for time, but only down to a point, and then they should bump along that point. Uh, if you calculate, you can calculate those quantities in the CFT side and interpolate them into the, into the ADS side, and you find you get back out not the exponential decay you'd expect from the quantum field theory description, but the um, bouncing along description you'd expect from the uh, quantum membrane paradigm description. And finally, and I won't get into the details of this, but you can kind of see it heuristically, if I've got a small black hole um, that's formed from informing matter, then because the whole system is fine, quantum mechanically finite dimensional, then for a, at a given energy level, then the Poincare recurrence theorem tells you that eventually you'll get back to that same state of informing matter. And so, and so the whole process would be energy. Of course, that's, that's vastly um, longer than the black hole evaporation time. That's compatible, for instance, with 
very long-lived remnant scenarios where the black hole takes a very long time to get rid of the last of its material, but it's not, um, it's not compatible with actual violation of immortality. Let me finish with the other side of this, the so-called firewall paradox. So, there was already, if you like, a puzzle about how there could be compatibility between these stories, because um, it looks as if the, inf you know, the, the um, uh, information that falls in just doesn't have a mechanism of getting out. The point of view of, you know, we've got this description of the quantum membrane paradigm where I've got this thermal membrane locally at the Planck temperature around the black hole, but an observer who's just falling in freely doesn't see that membrane. And that observer just doesn't see anything very interesting on the horizon at all. One of the famous examples, there could be an event horizon passing through this room right now and wouldn't be seeing anything. So, what this requires is that the modes of the radiation field just inside the horizon, just outside the horizon, need to be strongly entangled. If they're not strongly entangled, then uh, you know, then, then the informing um, observer wouldn't see that smooth horizon. That can't happen at the page time, or after the page time, if, if, or it doesn't seem possible to happen at the page time. If the black hole of radiation is unitary, then I need the modes just outside the event horizon to be maximally entangled with the modes that are emitted way, way early. Remember, this, remember how that works on the page time diagram, the, the early time radiation is maximally entangled with the internal state of the cooling body, but later, the late-time radiation is unentangled with the cooling body and maximally entangled with the early-time radiation. Well, something can't be maximally entangled with two things at once, that's what maximum means. Less flippantly, that's what the principles of quantum mechanics tells us. Um, the, uh, if the just outside modes are maximally entangled with radiation emitting much earlier, then they can't also be maximally entangled with radiation just inside, and so it looks as if the infalling um, observer can't see a smooth horizon to the black hole. And part of the point of the paradox I've presented is something like this. So, so that already looks like a contradiction, but there's already a tradition in this story of saying, well, the black, I need to regard the, the membrane description and the interior description as in some sense complementary in that the, the degrees of freedom on the interior of the black hole are somehow a redescription of the degrees of freedom on, on, on the surface of the black hole. Uh, Potentially philosophical question to ask about the coherence of that, but in any case, that's the underlying idea. It, you can think of it if you like as there's an encoding of the interior degrees of freedom in the membrane degrees of freedom. Um, and you might sort of wave your hands at that and hope that's also been hanging on the point. But what the um, AMPS, the initials of the author of the firewall paradox, pointed out was you can actually localize all this to the physics of a single observer. Take somebody who's really committed to doing quantum gravity experimentally. That person loiters outside the black hole, the cooling black hole, for of the order of ten to the eighty years. You know, the, the page about, about the page time, collecting every last photon. They perform um, a very, very delicate quantum correlation to um, uh, to extract from that a mode of uh, you know a, a extremely complicatedly constructed mode of the radiation here, which is maximally entangled with the next photon that's supposed to be coming out. They loiter close to the black hole of the horizon, collect that photon, and check indeed that it is entangled in it. And then, because loitering outside the black hole for 10 to 70 years was not a sufficient demonstration of their commitment to experimental science, they jump into the black hole. And they encounter on their way in, um, well, what do they encounter, I suppose? For a smooth horizon, they have to encounter, so goes the argument, um, a mirror mode just inside the horizon that was maximally entangled with the mode they just collected. Um, but they already know they can't encounter that because they've already checked that what they just saw was maximally entangled with the thing they already have. And there just isn't going to be a consistent quantum mechanical description of that process, even locally to the observer, whereby the observer first detects maximal entanglement between the outgoing and early time photons, and then detects maximal entanglement between the inside and the outside photons. So it looks as if um, black hole, uh, you know, the, the, insisting on unitarity, doesn't just lead us to worry about the coherence of the Hawking calculations, it leads us to lose the entire idea of a smooth horizon. And that seems to be in sharp tension with the equivalence principle and with our whole understanding of what's supposed to be going on in the global nature of black hole horizons. All right, so where does that leave us? Um, well, here's a quote from this um, that I want to leave us with from, from Daniel Harlow um, from, uh, in a recent review of the whole subject. Uh, Thus, we found that find ourselves in the enviable position of having an interesting problem with no really satisfying answer. If we're lucky, this means we'll learn something new. I'll stop there.
Thank you. Um, can I just take two seconds to get some more water? Yeah, actually, do you mind, could you grab some water? Thanks, some water, okay. I'll wait for... So, are there some questions from Geneva that you'd like to ask first? Uh, yes, I, I have a question about the part where, you know, like, the black holes of physical mechanics. Yeah. So you showed us three pieces of evidence, one coming from quantum mechanics, one from string theory, and one from the ADS-CLT correspondence. Yeah. Now, I don't know the details of uh, some of these calculations, but I suppose you call those physical mechanics because the whole types of state counting on you? Yes, exactly that, yeah. Now, in some cases, what the states you're counting are are more clear than others, but in all cases, you're applying a formula that you've derived from the stat max state counting definition. Again, you're, normally you start with the partition function, but it comes to the same thing. See if I've understood this correctly. So, so I'm, I'm assuming that the GR is an effective field theory setup. It's being cut off by some mechanism of the Planck length, um, and the calculations are all based on that framework. So, if I'm understanding right, Niels is saying, well, how about if some of these um, asymptotic safety scenarios are correct in, in, in quantum GR, and so actually it turns out that something like that theory is, is, is a UV complete quantum theory of gravity? Have I got that right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is interesting, and I have thought about this a little bit, and I'm not sure it's been that that much addressed in the um, in the asymptotic safety community, though I haven't, I don't know that literature super well. I think it's quite problematic, to be honest. I mean, so it's key in these calculations that I am actually regularizing in some sense. So um, the crudest first ones that were done were by Tuft, and the the uh, the, um, the regulator is what Tuft just calls a brick wall. He just puts a reflecting boundary condition around a black hole. Um, which effect, which which amounts to cutting off the high the, the high frequency degrees of freedom at very close to the horizon. Um, the subtler ones actually use sort of standard quantum field theory regulators. So you bring in um, uh, you bring in something like a, a Pauli Villas regulator or something. But again, of course, how you understand that technology without some kind of high energy cutoff is is, is a little questionable. But over and above that, it's kind of not not clear how it could be that calculations in a UV complete theory of this could possibly give us a finite answer given the infinite number of degrees of freedom there. But I absolutely admit I don't know that, that calculational space at all well. Um, and uh, you know, I, 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 could, I, could e I could easily be persuaded that actually I should expect a finite number of degrees of freedom for some reason inside the astronomic safety program even if it hasn't been shown. Okay. Well, here. So I have one more question if I may. As far as I can say it. Uh, so, 
I think in the paper, but the, perhaps not in the talk, you said that something something deep that we might learn from this is um, we might find a new theory of the interior of black holes, you know, explaining or, or theorizing, describing the physics inside black holes. Um, I'm not sure I quite see that because uh, from, from the quantum membrane paradigm, that's really only stating uh, the external physics. That, uh, uh, at least as I understand it, that description doesn't claim to touch anything uh, inside or on the event horizon, which is up to it, as it were. So, no. I'm not sure this is an open question, but I'm struggling to see. Yeah. Uh, what if anything we could learn about the interior of black holes as opposed to, to the physics as we approach black holes? Sure. So, I mean, two chunks of that. I mean, one, one, one of, well, the, the, let me say a few things, actually. So, so what, one thing to say is that the, the quantum membrane paradigm is normally understood, and complementarity is more commonly the name used, but I avoided that because of some connotations. The normal statement is that the interior degrees of freedom of the black hole are supposed to be a redescription of the membrane degrees of freedom of the black hole. So it's not that I've got everything that's going on outside the event horizon plus the membrane plus some additional interior degrees of freedom. I've actually given you a complete description if I give you the if I give you the exterior data plus the membrane, and somehow that's through, that that can be redescribed as a description which omits the membrane and includes an interior description. Um, and that's generally, although not universally, how people think about the ADS-CFT correspondence as well, that it's supposed to be a, a full correspondence, and, they, and so somehow the interior degrees of freedom as well as the exterior ones are encoded in the, in the CFT data. The, the other side of it is just the, um, why, why, why we kind of want the theory of this, is just that the, the most flat-footed description, if, if I just imagine I've got an entirely separate story of the interior, then we don't, and the, you know, there are interior degrees of freedom uh, that are additional to the membrane degrees of freedom and the exterior degrees of freedom, then it looks as if, and indeed those, those interior degrees of freedom are described appropriately by the quantum field theory description, then it looks like exterior degrees of freedom should be entangled with them. So it looks like the exterior evolution should be non-unitary. So in a sense, the unitarity of the exterior description, the unitarity of the exterior seems at least very closely connected to the claim that the interior is redescribed in the exterior. It's hard, it's hard to see how you could have an exterior unitarity without an interior description that was somehow holographically described by the exterior description. Okay, thank you. That's right. Do you have some more questions there? Not right now. Okay, Sebastian. Uh, yeah, thanks, David, for the talk. Um, so Make sure you speak nice and loud. This question is uh, kind of elementary. When you were presenting the like heuristic explanation of cooling in quantum systems, mm. and you said you have these two entropies, yeah, and the von Neumann one and the microcanonical one, yeah. But I, I, w I was able to follow that. But when we move to the black hole case, I'm not completely sure how to interpret these two kinds of different entropies, yeah. Uh, because, well, first, because I don't know very well the thermodynamics of black holes, and second, because I don't know the difference between the von Neumann and the microcanonical, I don't know how to translate them to the good. Okay. okay, so all of this only translates to the black hole case if you buy the claim that the black hole has an ordinary quantum mechanical, quantum statistical mechanical description. If it does, then in particular the entropy of the black hole needs to be the log, at a given energy, needs to be the log of the um, dimension of the Hilbert space of states at about that energy. There's always a little bit of fuzz in how you define the microcanonical ensemble, it doesn't matter for these purposes. So what's this, what's this microcanonical entropy? It's effectively the log of the state count of the, well, putting in classical terms, the number of possible states of the black hole, microstates of the black hole at that given energy. It's quantum mechanical, it's continuum many such, but it's a Hilbert space dimension claim. Uh, and the von Neumann entropy, again, if a black hole is an ordinary quantum system, it's supposed to have an ordinary quantum state. So the von Neumann entropy is just the usual entropy of that quantum state. As, as, it, as, it, um, as it becomes entangled with the radiation fields, that state moves from pure to mixed. Uh, as long as it was staying pure, it's one on an entropy of zero. Um, if it's mixed, this goes. I mean, this, this is a topological diagram. So I mean, don't 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 take a straight line as coding anything anything of, of significance. Um, so effectively, if a black hole is quantum mechanical, 
then as it cools, as in you know, as temperature goes up and as energy goes down, um, then its area goes down. As it, so its area goes down, then the full dimension of available quantum states decreases. But equally, if it's emitting thermal radiation, then the actual quantum state is getting more and more entangled with the radiation, so it's getting more and more mixed. So its entropy is going up. One, one good heuristic way of thinking about that is that the entropy of a quantum state is a measure of how spread out it is across the full Hilbert space. Uh, you, don't, I mean, you, you don't need to buy that heuristic. The, the maths will work but without it, but it, it's going to help with visualizing it. The, 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 the maximum von Neumann entropy uh, that a state can have is just when it's, a, when, when it's 1 over n times the projector onto the whole Hilbert space. So the maximum of a moment entropy a state can have at a given energy is just when it's proportional to projector onto the whole um, energy uh, subspace. At that point, the von Neumann entropy coincides with the microcanonical entropy. So the, that, so the microcanonical entropy is an upper bound on the von Neumann entropy, as long as the system uh, you know, remains in a reasonably narrow energy band. Um, but which, which it does, because again, we know, we know from the way the black hole cools that it, that it doesn't spread wildly um, across energy states. So once the microcanonical entropy reaches the von Neumann entropy, since the microcanonical entropy plans to keep going down, thanks, the von Neumann entropy's got to turn over. And what that translates to is it's got to be the case that the um, subsequent radiation is no longer entangled with it, and indeed um, the entanglement is being mapped out. Because after all this, because the whole process is, th is, is pure, then the von Neumann entropy of the black hole is also the total von Neumann entropy of the radiation emitted. So you can also read that lower von Neumann graph if you want as the entropy of the radiation. So you can see the entropy, the radiation starts out thermal and then turns over at this point and starts, be, and starts purifying again. So that's, that's all. I have a similar question. Wonderful talk, by the way. Um, and yeah, so my, my question was, you, you, you sort of sold this story as being one that could be told independently of the radiating system being a black hole. Yeah. Um, so I was just wondering to what extent you could set up the paradox in this context. And it, it struck me that there's, um, well, in the story you told anyway, there's potentially a, a logical incoherence in that it seemed like we've got this unitary process going up to the page time, and then you started this, I, I don't know how much of this is just a gloss, or <coughs> you said that now we're getting photons entangled with the earlier yeah. uh, photons. So I just wanted to how can you implement a coherent unitary account of that process anyway without bringing in black holes? Yeah. So if evolution is <coughs> unitary, then, then absolutely cooling systems, even not black holes, um, are going to have to, I, I, I can't literally be emitting thermal radiation all the way through. But one of the crucial things you can observe is that the, the highly non-thermal radiation can look thermal. Um, so, if I if I were to take the if I take a you know a red hot iron sphere and I to cool down and I just collect all the radiation, um, it's going to have to be the case on pain and violating um, unitarity that the radiation once the sphere has cooled down sufficiently much is not actually a perfect thermal state. But it's possible. But what, what you can you can argue heuristically very plausibly that if I consider the subs the, the, the quantum state of any subspace of that, sub, that, any arbitrarily chosen subspace of that radiation, I could be pretty much guaranteed to encounter a, something that's a thermal state on that subspace. And if I make any given measurement other than some incredibly carefully tuned during measure of the whole system, I'll get the same results as if I got a thermal state. It's, this is very closely related to the sort of standard system mechanical thermodynamic idea that the, the von Neumann entropy of, a cool, of, a, of an evolving system can't actually approach equilibrium in the literal sense because it's a conserved quantity, but in some kind of coarse grain sense can approach equilibrium, which, which you can catch out as saying for anything other than an incredibly tuned set of measurements, it's going to it's, it's going to look as if it's um, reached equilibrium. So if you ask how, how do you implement that kind of thing, I mean you can you can do sort of qubit models relatively straightforwardly. If you imagine you imagine you just got an ordinary kind of mixing model, uh, and I played a little bit with this, but I haven't got one. I, that's quite a prime time, but there are various ones in the, in the physics literature. If you imagine I've got an ordinary sort of collection of qubits and I've got some process whereby I entangle that in the environment and I keep doing it, you can fairly easily get out models where that process is going to look for all the world like the emission of thermal radiation. And it really is going to emission of thermal radiation for quite a long time, but eventually you'll reach a point where super delicate correlations, if you can, make, if you can measure them, 
going to show up the fact it's not really thermal. The problem is that it I mean, for a for an ordinary cooling thermal system, we haven't got the existence of this dual description of the cooling process, not in terms of kind of uh, entanglement with thermal mass radiation, but in terms of the Hawking process on the horizon. It's the and then it doesn't it doesn't seem as if um, that kind of well, it's not thermal, it looks thermal description is going to help us for understanding the um, uh, the, the um, how the Hawking process could make sense or how the black hole could avoid developing a firewall. Now, I think I, I have thoughts as how one can be on that, map, but they're perhaps a bit unformed. But... In fact, one thing that's worth saying, which is you know, various people have played, including me, which gets close to some of my other interests, um, uh, it's possible to think of the system. You know, one way to think about the ordinary thermal cooling system is, um, well, it's cool. It's not emitting thermal radiation, but it's a mixture of, of, of but, but yeah, to max, it's a maximum mixed state at, at this point for its energy. It's its evolution into it's, it's, yeah, this, the, the system at the page time is maximally mixed for its given energy. It's going to evolve into a system that's maximally mixed for its given energy, but that's actually squeezes in the other space, and so it requires um, some kind of. Uh, you know, emission of stuff that's entangled well stuff to make it work. So, so it's not emitting thermal radiation, but it is a mixture of quantum states, each of which can individually be described as emitting thermal radiation. And in fact, pretty much any arbitrary decomposition of the system uh, into, into, pure, into being a mixture of pure states gives the result that each of those pure states is emitting thermal radiation. So there's a kind of Everettian story that I'm attempting to tell, which says something like, well, the um, uh, the process, the, the, the whole unitary god time process, of course, is unitary, but as looked at from the point of view of any, of any given observer, that observer's just seeing one branch of the wave function, so that observer's seeing, um, uh, seeing the thermal process, and that observer sees the smooth horizon. Sean Carroll's played in models like that, I've played models like that a bit, but not, not at a written enough stage. So the, the, yeah, ten, ten, the, it'll be cute if some of that would be made to work, but I don't think it's been anything like demonstrated that it hasn't been made to work. So you could you could say all that in terms of um, Heisenberg picture observables for a, for an observer um, measuring a subspace. Uh, plausibly, I mean, I mean, I mean, this whole story is unitary, so one ought to be able to map that between showing an Heisenberg picture descriptions about the problem. I find the Heisenberg picture hard to think in, except for some very specific examples, just for the tense of doing all the calculation you then throw away. But um, you know, it's entirely possible, isn't it? Inside we got there. So I have, yeah, I have a few questions, okay. but maybe since we're here, I'll start. Would start with this one, um, and I guess I was thinking of this in relation. I mean, you put up one quote from from Tim, mm. but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how the, the whatever the dialectic between his paper and yours. So, mm. and as I remember, his the point of his paper is um, he's comparing whatever it was, the sigma one and sigma three, and saying, of course, I mean, that's kind of your, maybe I'm just repeating what you're saying. Um, well, it's not a, one of them's not a Cauchy surface, so we shouldn't yeah. expect unitarity. And so that's the force of your argument is, but look, that's not going to be an answer to this page time problem. Exactly. Yeah. So, do you have, so then the question is, do you have a sense where he's going to, where he goes from there? Not particularly. I mean, I mean, the the, the, the thing that's unfortunate, I think, about about that team's paper is that it um, it engages very much with this tradition of the El Jewish community, um, and on the back of that runs the argument basically everyone's confused in in string theory and quantum gravity, but it doesn't actually there's there's no there's no engagement in the paper of what's actually being said in that in, in, in that community, and I think if you do engage, then you find they're just talking about something quite different. So Tim's paper, you know, leaving out the sociology aspects of it, is presenting a, it, 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 it's presenting the um, the evaporation time, what I'm calling the evaporation time paradox, um, and then it's um, what's what's novel about it from that point of view is Tim wants to play around with the idea that we should that, that you know, given how how time works in a space time description, I shouldn't. It just doesn't really make sense to talk about evolution from here. To here, the only thing I'm allowed to do that a Cauchy surface. Tim wants to play up the idea that a co that I want, I, I really want to see the Cauchy surface defined there or something. Now, strictly, that's not a Cauchy surface because this point sort of is, a, is a naked singularity. Um, Tim is speculating, in effect, about some kind of generalization of the differential structure of GR, a 
according to which you'd have some generalization of Cauchy, of, of Cauchy surfaces where people would count as a Cauchy surface. Um, there's, uh, but there's a sort of technical concern you might have here that, that Jim Weatherall and John Manchin played, which is that you, you want to, re I mean, Penrose diagrams are, um, don't map one to one into underlying space times. So the fact that you can describe what something looks like on a Penrose diagram doesn't give you a reliable reason to think that you've described something on a space time that makes sense. So the, sort, the sorts of surface one ends up describing here end up being weirdly pathological according to Magic Weatherall's paper because of how pathological the space time gets around the naked singularity. Um, I, don't, I don't really have a dog in that fight. Um, I mean, my, uh, my, my, in the dialectic, my, my story just sort of bypasses this because I don't, I don't think this kind of thing is what uh, Suskin or Malsina or Stromager or anyone was thinking about. Um, obviously, not what John Page is thinking about. And I think, insofar as you buy those arguments, then uh, this kind of description in some way failed way before um, uh, the, um, the, the, the evaporation stuff kicks in. Because, you know, my sigma 2 here, I mean, by coincidence actually, but I've kind of drawn that about the page time. So, you know, this, this, is, this is a pen diagram, but, you know, heuristically it's about half, well, halfway up. So, this sigma 2 is well after the evaporation has proceeded a long way through. So, on uh, the evolution from sigma 1, according to the membrane paradigm story, the evolution is supposed to be unitary not just from sigma 1 to sigma 2, but from sigma 1 to the exterior part of sigma 2. Um, and insofar as it is, then I seem to be having a, a contradiction with the Hawking description of what's going on here which requires entanglement between the state of sigma 2 and the state in here. Um, and and, and um, it's first, that, if that's right, then I need, I, need, I need to start breaking the rules that this diagram commits to here. And once that happens, then you know, I, either it turns out that, they've had, that, the, that we have to give up on the quantum stat net description, or we somehow finesse the Q of T description to carry on talking about Hawking radiation, even though the degrees of freedom are somehow in some appropriate sense leaking out. And at that point, the whole story looks just Looks different. I've got a on the on the on the membrane paradigm story. I've got a unitary evolution of the outside horizon degrees of freedom, and, and, then, and then and then from that point of view, this space time is just perfectly happily behaved. It's just um, I've got a description on slices like this going into slices like that. But I mean, it's slightly difficult to engage the dialectic because the paper is sort of frustratingly not engaged at all with what that about? whole community. So Andrew and Wolf recently did a review of this stuff as well, right? But do they talk about the? No, no. I mean, they're, they're not. They're not much engaged with it either. Um, they really do seem to be just people talking largely past each other. Some of it's cultural, I think, because the um, uh, the style of and this this is now sociological speculation, but the the style of sort of high church relativity, you might call it. Um, uh, relies on a sort of mathematical rigor and mathematical clarity, which classical general relativity has, has modelled for most of the 20th century, uh, which particle physics really hasn't modelled. Um, the whole style and methodology and ways of doing things in string theory um, is very much a descendant of the way they've been done in particle physics, and where the rules of the game there are, insofar as you can calculate things, and particularly you can calculate them multiple ways and get the same answer, then uh, you're probably describing something reasonably well, the mathematical details will take care of themselves when you've got the framework. Um, but that whole, you know, there's, a, there's a real difficulty, I think, in people even reading each other's papers across that divide. And I think I've, I've spoken to Bellinger about I'm not sure if it's the mathematical details will take care of themselves, but we'll find something else and better before we have to straighten it all out. Well, there's some of that too, but I mean, if you think, I mean, the, I think the, the classic example of this is something like Nelson and Normalization, so uh -huh. there's a skip that. Uh, uh -huh. we, 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 we had the, the kind of fairly hand-waving tricks of finding it out to sort out, to, to formulate, formally make sense of the normalization. Where for a while, it's all for a while. One thing that could have happened there was that we went back and put one field theory on a completely solid mathematical conceptual foundation and then developed it forward. That's the dream of Streeter and Whiteman and the whole AGFT mm -hmm. program. What actually happened was we carried on muddling through it and then in due course, um, sort of Kogan and Wilson and, and the whole effect of the community, we knew this stuff. I do the, the whole effective field theory framework came into play and it turned out that that was a way to make sense of it. But you probably wouldn't have got to that unless you kind of muscled right. forward with these methods and developed a stronger calculation understanding. And that's very much, I think, the methodology of the, the string theory community, which is very much the intellectual descendants of the particle physics community. Yeah. 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 Ye
but again, again this isn't a sociology paper, I'm really speculating <laughs> how the field actually played out. I have another question related to this thing. Uh, so at some point you said we have all this behavior uh, of a black hole as a thermodynamic system. It makes sense to infer that there has to be an underlying statistical mechanics yeah. description of that thing. Um, in some ways I am not very sure I can the inference is the same way as in the other case because in one case you are trying to describe things like temperature and so on. Yeah. Like, Uncertainty about the exact positions of particles in the other. This is a very naive way of doing it. That. Yeah. That's the main idea. In the other case, I'm not completely sure. It's not clear what I'm trying to modeling in terms of uncertainty or in terms of some like. And is it like quantum particles again inside the black hole that are trying to? No, right. No, so probably yeah. not anyway. Yeah. Well, I mean, the short, quick, quick, short answer is it, it's yeah. the it's the degrees of freedom of the theory. Um, in the close proximity to the event horizon. But, but to go back to your starting point, I mean, I think you got the analogy slightly wrong. I mean, statist the statistical mechanics of a gas says the temperature is about our modeling of our uncertainty of all the actual locations of the particles. But the thermodynamics of the gas precedes that and doesn't have any of that motivational starting point. We developed the thermodynamics of gas in the you know, mid, mid 1800s, um, and uh, the, that, that thermodynamic stands on itself perfectly solidly and coherently. It has a very thorough and successful microphysical grounding. So the you know in the in the quantum gravity case, uh, the black hole thermodynamics is supposed to be analogous to indeed seems to be continuous with the ordinary um, thermodynamics. Um, and then the expectation is well if um, if there's this sharp analogy or indeed continuity here, and if all the other systems in question have um, sort of have a statistical mechanical story that explains the thermodynamic story. Wouldn't we expect there to be a statistical mechanical story explaining the black hole bit, and shouldn't we therefore try to find it? That's true that obviously in, in 20th century applications of, of, of um, statistical mechanics to unfamiliar systems, quite often we've had the, the microphysics before, we've had the thermodynamics, and so we've actually developed the thermodynamics from the microphysical starting point. But, you know, it's still perfectly possible to discover the thermodynamic properties of systems without having a clue what the interior behavior is. And then, yeah, the, Think about high temperature superconductors or something. We understood those phenomenologically well before we had a good model of them. We still don't have a very good model. My other question, well, it's a couple other things, but one was um, going back to sort of well, the first or the, the middle part of the talk mm -hmm. when you talked about string theory calculations for the extremal and yeah. near extremal black holes. Yeah. But you didn't mention the sort of earlier approach using sort of adiab assumption of adiabat adiabatic transformations, where I've seen pretty strong claims made about the reliability of those. So Suskind has a review paper where he's not just talking about the extreme, I mean, he mentions the, the extremal ones, but a lot of the focus is on using an adiabatic approximation where you somehow just assume the state counting is not going to be changed as you actually move quite away from in the extremal case, you do the counting at the extremal, I guess, or? Yeah, uh, pass. That's, I mean, this is a huge literature. That's not a corner of it, I particularly know. I mean, perhaps, perhaps a small thing I say to that, I mean, so, go, the, sorry. Was the question was, yeah. do you, oh, okay, so maybe that, I mean, the specific question, maybe that's what you took implicitly was, do you think those, or is those kind of calculations are as, I mean, they're not as reliable, I take it, but are they kind of reliable in a way that will be useful here? Is I'm I'm not entirely sure. I mean, I mean, look, put it this way. Um, I think reproducing the area formula is relatively cheap. Um, uh, if you tell me my magic statistical mechanical theory of black holes reproduces the area formula, well, it's not a very complicated formula. Um, you knew what it was in advance, and you um, and yeah, the black hole area looks like it. It looks relatively easy to see ways in which if you just put degrees, of, you could just scatter degrees of freedom in the vicinity of the center and it looks like you could, you're very easily going to get out of area type formula out of that. So I don't find myself that moved by those sorts of results. I think the things that are much more compelling are in, in these calculation, calculations of the fact that we get the subleading order terms, we get the, I suppose I didn't stress this in another talk, the fact that we get the one loop log m corrections out, the fact that we get the higher gravity corrections to the area formula out, and we get them out in this kind of positive de detail. That's the, that, that's the kind of thing that I think is, is 
ought to be ought, ought to be disturbing to the skeptic. I think I think if you basically think this kind of thing works, and you then want to want to explore its implications further, then you might well want to play around with questions about adiabaticity and, and arguments of that sort. Uh, I'm not sure they're as convincing if one's just if one needs persuading in advance that there is a clear and black hole stand there. But I'll kind of I'll, I'll circle back to the original thing. I'm not that familiar with that particular yeah. line of literature. I said it kind of wrong. So I mean the idea. So one of the nice things about the adiabatic approach, as I understand it, is you can model a whole kind range of different kind of black holes. So you mm. have like curved black holes, and as well as it's not just the short scale okay. one. I mean, and so it works in a whole yeah. range of cases. Um, what I didn't say or didn't get right is the adiabatic bit is for turning off the gravitational coupling. So you, you do the counting in the free case, and as far as I can see, you assume because you could turn gravity back on slowly, it wouldn't make a difference yeah. to the case where there's grab. Where yeah. I mean that coupling thing's happened working in the uh, um, in this case in the extremal yeah, as well, that's except that's you just have it under control. That's right. It's, it's, the same, it's, it's the same the same argument, but now you have a topological conservation right. principle. Of so I don't know, yeah, so I don't know how detailed the formulas are, um, but what I do think is the case, that, right, it's exactly this thing, you can get them in a kind of wider range of cases, of yeah. different kinds of black hole solutions, which is kind of interesting. Yes. I mean, I'll admit that the, 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 st the string theory references in this talk are very much the place where I'm more a consumer of this stuff than an engagement. I, 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 I basically have a reading this on the grip of how this stuff works in the QFT but side, and I more or less get how any CFT correspondence works, but, and I can play around the calculation stuff there. My, I don't, I, I'm not in control of how the string theory calculation side of it works, so I, don't, I, 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 can, yeah, I, can, I can read the papers and understand that they're broad outlines of great results, but I, I, I don't ask me to fill in there. The details here, you probably know better than I do. Well, I think that's probably doubtful, but uh, maybe more so independence or something. <laughs> it's not really in the details. Do you have some more questions in Geneva? I don't think so, thank you. Could, uh, since we have a, maybe a couple more minutes, if it's okay, just about the firewalls? Yeah. Sabine Hossenfelder claims that this is, she has a sort of refutation of this stuff, and, and maybe other people do as well. Do you do you understand what she's what her response is? Um, well, as I recall, Hossenfelder just doesn't think the arguments for unitarity are very persuasive. And if you, if you, if you don't think the arguments for unitarity are persuasive, then the whole thing about, about so to speak, about it's way. Um, okay. Beyond that, I'm not okay. not particularly sure. Uh, I mean the. the you get you only get the firewall process if you think that the outside black hole dynamics are fully unitary. And there's a lot there. Are people people in the on gravity position, for instance, want to say things like, well, you might well be the entropy might be counting the outside horizon degrees of freedom, but the evaporation is just new degrees of freedom coming from inside the you know, what was all being generated. The interior point and the entanglement is with interior degrees of freedom. That just aren't being caught by the um, by the entropy count that's going on. I don't think that's persuasive because I think the whole the whole argument that the black hole statistical mechanical story works only works if I've got a full self-consistent thermal story of the exterior, and that thermal story needs in particular to be treating the black hole radiation as just ordinary thermal radiation. If the black hole radiation has to be understood as something completely different that just happens to numerically coincide with what you would have expected if it's killed normally then we seem to be back to the inexplicable miracle situation. But I wouldn't, you know, I, that's, that's based on sort of relatively fair remarks of Hossenfels that come across in various places. It's not based on a detailed engagement for what I said. Okay. Can <laughs> <laughs> you say feedback, Luke? Yeah. Do you guys want to go again? Or are you... How much are we trying to get to? Um, no, I think you're Okay, and you're all good in um, Geneva? Okay, well let's say thank you one more time and call it a day. That's about our hour and a half, so.